All right. Well, I think I think maybe maybe we'll begin even if the uh, last few people come in. So I want to talk about two related techniques today. They're related in pulse sequence. They're completely different in what they do. One of them is is Toxi, and one of them is is Rosy. So Toxi is a correlation experiment. It stands for Total Correlation Spectroscopy. I'll put total in quotes because one doesn't get an infinite number of cross peaks. This uh, technique was co-developed uh, developed at the same time with another technique that's the same pulse sequence called ho ha ha, which always sounds good at <laughs> always sounds good at Christmas time. It stands for homonuclear Hartman Hahn spectroscopy, and they're the same same technique, but um, Toxi Toxi has has taken over. So the idea is that you get cross peaks. with all, and again, I'm going to put this in quotes because there are limits, other spins in the spin system. And so what this, what this technique is like is it's like a super cozy. I mean, I'll give you a, a really simple example here. If we have propanol, and that was sort of the, uh, the sketch of the molecule when I gave the first intro to 2D spectra. If you have propanol, COSY will link your methyl group to your central methylene, and it'll link the central methylene to the next methylene, and assuming the OH is exchanging rapidly, that won't be linked in there. What TOXI will do, since all of these groups are in the same spin system, is Toxi will also link the methyl group to the terminal methylene. And where Toxi really, really shines, there are sort of two different situations that Toxi really shines. In the small molecules realm, where Toxi really shines is in situations of overlap. And I've been pretty good about giving you spectra where there's not too much overlap and you can walk your way through cozy. But sometimes you'll end up with peaks overlapping on other peaks and you simply stop being able to walk your way through. And so you look and you say, hey, what's going on here? I can't figure out my, my way all the way through. So I'll just give you a couple of hypothetical examples that, that maybe illustrate my thinking on this of a case where you might have overlap. So like if you take a molecule pentanol and we think about where things typically show up at it, we'd say, all right, plain vanilla methyl is 0.4. A methylene that's next to an oxygen, say, is at 3.5 parts per million. A methylene that's beta to an oxygen, that's going to be, I don't know, somewhere around 1.9 parts per million. But by the time you get down to this methylene chain, bless you, you're going to have your methylene's pretty much unperturbed, both at about 1.4 ppm. In other words, if you go into the cozy spectrum, you're going to get into a quagmire right here where you have trouble tracing your way through the cozy spectrum. And so those types of issues, if you've got multiple spin systems in the molecule and you're really trying to figure out what your fragments are, those types of issues can be problematic. And so again, let me give you an a molecule and just sort of talk about typical chemical shifts. So if we'd say, all right, an ester, a methylene next to an ester, I usually think 4.1 ppm. Plain vanilla methylenes, I think about 0.9, uh, methyls, I think about 0.9 parts per million. A methyl group that's beta to a carbonyl, I think about say about 1.1 parts per million. In other words, it's beta to an electron withdrawing group, so it's at the plane position shifted down by a couple of tenths of a ppm. But then if you think about a methine that's, say, beta to an oxygen, normally I think about a methine maybe at 1.9 ppm. 
but by being beta to an oxygen, maybe it'll be at about 2.4 ppm. And normally I'll think of, say, a methyl group as next to an ester as being about two parts per million, but if it's a methylene group, it'll go down by another about 0.4 parts per million. So you could easily see how a molecule like this might have two spin systems where when you try to trace your way through, you get caught up. And so if everything overlapped at 2.4, it would be really hard in a cozy of a molecule like this to distinguish this spin system from this one. In other words, to try to walk your way through and see if this methyl was part of a different spin system than this methyl over here. And Toxy is extremely good at doing this. The other thing that Toxy is good at, there's a parameter that's very important in Toxy called the spin lock mixing time. And so when I say all other spins in the spin system, we're typically talking about within a limit, maybe, maybe through about seven bonds. If you vary the spin lock mixing time, and you can use Toxy as sort of a super cozy experiment, where if you have a very short time, you basically get just one jump, just like from here to here. But if you go a little longer, two jumps starts to appear. If you go a little longer in your spin lock mixing time, more and more goes. So you can do a series of Toxy experiments that'll basically walk your way from one spin to the next to the next. And what's good is if you have a region where there's overlap and then a region where there isn't overlap, so like the, the overlap might be a 2.4 in this molecule, and the region that doesn't have overlap might be at, say, 1.4 one and point nine, you can go ahead and walk along those toxy tracks and see who the coupling partner is for each and then do longer and longer mixing times to pick them all out. So that's one really good use for, for toxy is overlap. The other really good use is, I'll call it biopolymers, which sounds like, like something intimidating. But any sort of molecule that has unit uh, spin systems that are units within it. So there are many types of uh, macro, uh, macrolactams and many types of antibiotic uh, cyclic esters that have unnatural amino acids that have a series of spin systems. I'll just show you some biopolymers. So for example, peptides and proteins. And so if you think about it, each amino acid in a peptide or a protein is its own spin system. And so forth, where each unit comprises a spin system. And so you can pick out all of these spin systems and basically very quickly assign all of the resonances in a polypeptide. And we'll do an example of this with a cyclic peptide. Sugars are another example. We just saw Professor Peng Wu's uh, seminar and he was working with various types of oligosaccharides. And so each oligosaccharide, each monosaccharide unit is an isolated <coughs> unit, and they're often very heavily overlapped. And so I'm just giving sort of a generic cartoon of, a, of an oligosaccharide structure. And so each sugar unit is its own spin system. And Toxy, they're very crowded together. They all end up having similar chemical shifts. And Toxy really shines at working with oligosaccharides. And the other area that works out very well with, with Toxy is nucleic acids, DNA and RNA, where again, the basic unit is sugars and bases, and each sugar is its own little spin system. And 
So you have a nuclear base, and depending on if it's DNA or RNA, you'll have an OH at these positions. So I'll just put this in, in brackets. So again, all of these are representing kind of pieces of a of a biopolymer structure that might be might be useful for elucidating So, as I was hinting at before, one of the limits of Toxy is it doesn't go on forever. And so the limits are, I'm going to say, I always hate to put a hard number, about seven bonds. So, for example, what do I mean? I mean, let's say we look at the molecule lysine. So lysine is an amino acid with a four carbon chain. I'll put this as I'll put this as part of a biopolymer. So if you're talking about tracing your way from the epsilon carbon to the NH group, you're going through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bonds. That's about as far as you would go. And so in other words, you'll end up having this hydrogen, if you do it right, crossing with all of the methylenes along the way, giving cross peaks, as well as if you do it right, the NH group, unless you do the experiment in D2O, in which case the NH group will have, will have exchanged. So as I said, the parameter is, the key parameter is a mixing time. And typically, this is one of the experiments. The, the experiments downstairs that are like a COSY experiment or an HMQC experiment or an HMBC experiment, the parameters John Greaves gives you, if you take this sort of default 10 hertz um, HMBC experiment, that's going to be one size sort of fits all. In the case of a toxy experiment, you actually have to think intelligently about the experiment. Typical values are about 75 to 100 millisecond spin lock mixing time. And you'd obviously, you'd want to go to the high end to pick up longer correlations. You might go up to, say, 200 milliseconds. If you go shorter, particularly if you're down sort of in the, let's say, 25 to 75 range, you'll be using the experiment as kind of a super cozy, but one where you can walk your way from one bond to the next to the next. Now, one of the implications for your own project is that um, with strychnine is because strychnine has some really extended spin systems, you may not be able to trace your way through all of the spin systems, but you'll be able to get part way. The other limitation, so obviously, so one limit is the number of bonds. The other limit is your coupling basically proceeds uh, directly depending on how strongly things are coupled. In other words, if you have a very small J, that can lead to an absence of cross peaks. So it's not so much an issue with a flexible chain, but if you come down to strychnine and you're tracing your way through a spin system where one dihedral is close to 90 degrees, so your coupling constant is very small, you know, a hertz or two or zero hertz, if you have a really small coupling constant, toxy may not take you through. Basically, you need to have some reasonably large coupling. So you may see things behaving as if they're isolated spin systems or nearly nearly isolated spin systems. 
So at the end, now the nice thing about Toxi, as I said, is it's very good at dealing with overlap. And I'll show you in just a moment an example where you just would be struggling like crazy by Cozy, and we're going to assign, you know, a zillion different protons in one fell swoop. There's an alternative that's extremely powerful, and we'll talk about it in the last week of class, and that's the HMQC Toxi. So Toxi works as long as you can find some regions where there aren't overlap and you can get like one resonance that isn't overlapping. But if you've got really bad overlap, you may even have trouble tracing your way through with Toxi. HMQC Toxi is a variant that's like Toxi, but it has uh, the dispersion of the C13 dimension. Remember, C13 resonances, because you have 200 ppm, end up having very little overlap. And so the dispersion can be very, very powerful. That's too much for us to assimilate at this point. So let me just, um, let me just say I'll, I'll show you that in the future. All right, what I'd like to do now is to talk about, give us an example of one molecule. We're going to assign every resonance in this molecule. And the molecule is gramicidin S. It's an antibiotic. And it's a non-ribosomal peptide. What that means is it's not synthesized by the traditional tRNA, you know, DNA, uh, messenger RNA, tRNA mechanism. And its structure consists of five amino acids that are repeated twice. And so I'm going to draw, draw the structure of the molecule. And I'll draw it kind of in a stylized fashion because I think that's that's actually useful for reflecting the conformation of the molecule. So the molecule starts with a proline. And we next continue with a valine. And we next, it's a non-ribosomal non polypeptide, so we next have an Unna oh, call it unnatural amino acid, but it would be better to say non-proteinogenic or non-ribosomal amino acid. And so the next one, I'll label this as valine. The next one is ornithine. Ornithine's like lysine, except instead of having a four-carbon chain, it has a three-carbon chain, so one, two, three. The next amino acid in the molecule is leucine. And the final amino acid before we repeat ourselves is the unnatural enantiomer of phenylalanine. So that's D-phenylalanine. And so that's half the molecule. And then the molecule repeats itself. So let me write leucine up here. Then the molecule repeats itself. And so now we're going to continue around with proline. And the next amino acid is valine. And then we come to ornithine once again. And then we come to leucine. Can you move the glass a second further? 
Um, <laughs> just draw it. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, if you don't want to draw it out, that's that's fine too. Um, do you have anything better to be doing right now? <laughs> All right, as you can. As you can see, there are, a lot, there are a lot of different hydrogens in this molecule. And one thing to keep in mind is there's actually some sense to all of this. In other words, you look at a molecule like this and you'd say, oh, well, okay, alpha protons, that's the proton that's directly next to the nitrogen and next to the carbonyl. And you're going to say, oh, wait, that's next to an electron withdrawing group. It's tertiary, and it's beta, it's alpha to a carbonyl. And so you'd say, oh, OK, well, you know, tertiary brings you downfield. Next to a carbonyl shifts you downfield. Next to an electron withdrawing group shifts you downfield. And you end up in the four to five part per million range. Or you look at the beta proton, say in valine, that's one over, and you'd say, oh, well, OK, now that's beta to an electron withdrawing group, so that's going to go downfield a little bit. It's tertiary, so that's going to go downfield a little bit. So it's going to be a little downfield of two parts per million. Or you look at the gamma protons, the ones on the methyl groups, and you're going to say, oh, OK, those are methyl groups that aren't really near to anything. So those will be like 0.9 or maybe, maybe 1 ppm. And so similarly, we're going to have alpha, beta, gamma, delta for the ornithine. And we'll have alpha, beta, gamma, and delta for the leucine, and alpha, and beta, and then all the phenyls, which if you wanted to, you could call them you know, delta, epsilon, et cetera. And then similarly for the pro proline, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. So we start to make some sense of this. Now, one thing that's nice, even if you're not an expert in this area, even if you don't do this stuff a lot, what's nice is, OK, you can always sort of look up where things typically show up. And so I will start with a little handout for you. And basically, what, what these data that I'm passing out are is really just what we've, we've intuited when I started to go through the valine there with an example. These are just typical chemical shifts of unstructured amino acids in water. By unstructured, I mean not part of any sort of alpha helix or beta sheet. And so pretty much just as I went through and said, hey, we can intuit that your alpha proton on your valine is going to be somewhere in the four to five parts per million region, and your beta protons are going to be somewhere a little downfield of two parts per million, and your gamma protons are going to be somewhere around 0.9 parts per million. You can go ahead and look that up. And you can do the same thing for leucine. And so this basically provides you with good guidance for things you might, might already really really no. I mean, in other words, you look, say, at ornithine, and you'd say, OK, well, you know, where should the delta protons at ornithine show up? Well, you've got this ammonium group next to them. Nitrogen isn't as electron withdrawing. So you'd say, oh, about three parts per million. But you could look and say, OK, lysine, where does it say for the epsilon 
protons on lysine, and you'd say, oh, okay, about three parts per million. My intuition is correct. So this can be a nice help. The flip side gives you all 20 of the proteinogenic amino acids, so you don't have to, um, don't have to go ahead and, and know exactly what they are. All right. So we are going to use these to help us assign our resonances, but of course, ultimately, because things will vary, this compound has some structure to it. It happens to adopt a beta sheet structure. Things may not show up at exactly these positions, plus every amino acid's neighbor will shift it around. But you can look and say, okay, where would I expect, say, the beta protons of phenylalanine to show up? And you can say, well, it's a methylene, it's, gonna, it's next to a benzene ring, it's beta to a nitrogen. You'd say, oh, somewhere around 3 ppm. Or you could go ahead and say, look, where would I see for, for phenylalanine? Oh, yeah, I'd see somewhere around three parts per million for the beta protons. All right. What I would like to do at this point is to, for us, to look at the actual toxic spectrum of gramicidin S. And so to answer your question, yes, the structure is written out. So if your drawing really did look like a disaster, then you have it here, but then you'll have to keep have to keep flipping, flipping over and over again to, to keep labeling our resonances. All right, so what's funny? <laughs> it's only good for one laugh. It never gets two out of people. <laughs> And it's not even Christmas time. <laughs> All right. So whenever I'm dealing with a heavily overlapping spectrum and I want to help my eyes out, I like to slap a grid on the thing just to help, help me see things line up. Um, you can also use a ruler, but it's very, very nice and very gentle on your eyes to be able to say trace a cross peak over and then trace the cross peak right up over here. So I, I like to do that. Um, what's, because Toxi is like a super cozy, you basically can trace an entire track off of Toxi and get everything in a spin system. Now remember, a spin system isn't always the whole amino acid. So for example, in phenylalanine, the benzene ring is one spin system that's separate for all intents and purposes, not coupled to the alpha proton, the beta proton, and the NH proton. I'll even draw in, draw in my NH. So this happens to be a spectrum in DMSO. So this is in DMSO D6. And this particular one happens to have a 78 millisecond spin lock spin mixing time. Now, one thing about molecules with NHs and OHs, those generally exchange rapidly. So if I took a spectrum in D2O, we would just see an HOD peak like we did in our cyclic, in our um, hydroxyproline problem. We just see HOD. But in DMSO D6, the protons don't exchange. So you're going to have NHs and so forth there. If you want to see your NHs in water, you can actually do an, expect, uh, an experiment where you use 50, where you use 90% H2O and 10% D2O for locking. So most of your protons, 90% of your protons stay as NHs. And then you use water suppression because you're working with millimoles of compound in 100 molar water, you know, 55, 50 molar H2O and you know, 100 molar of, of protons. All right, so let us start and let's look at the anatomy of the, the spectrum. So the anatomy of our spectrum, and I'll show you along this axis, your alpha protons are over here, your methyls, 
are over here. Your NHs are over here. This is your phenyl group, so I'll, I'll label it. We'll put all of our labels here. So this is our phenyl group from the phenylalanine. And let's see, you've got some, some betas and gammas and, and deltas over here. So. So that, that kind of gives us our starting anatomy, right? Our methyls are kind of at the 0.9 ppm range. Your alphas that are directly next to electron withdrawing groups are down here. Your NHs that are attached to nitrogen are over here. All right, what we're going to do now is use Toxy to assign every resonance. And I want to show you the power of the Toxy technique. And we'll just take a single track in the toxy. So I'll start off of this peak here that's a tight little doublet and I'll draw a line just to help my eye trace along. And you look and you say, okay, so what sort of residue has an alpha proton and a couple of protons at about three parts per million. Is it the valine? What does the valine have in its spin system? And what types of protons do we get in the, the valine? We're, what residues, what do you have in valine that you don't have in, say, ornithine or phenylalanine or proline? Methyl. So we would expect cross peaks somewhere up here. So it's not a valine. It's not a leucine. So we have alpha protons and one other sort of proton in that, res, in that residue. So what is that residue? And those protons are right around three parts per million. So phenylalanine, because we just have two other protons, the two diastereotopic beta protons. So you trace your way up here. And in this cluster of three, which we could expand upon, is your phi alpha. And you trace your way up here. And here are your two diastereotopic phi betas. And you can kind of see the ABX pattern of one of the phi betas tenting into the other. So that basically assigns one of our residues. All right, let's go on to another one. Let me take this toxy track. So I'm going to label this guy as well. He's our phi NH. So we are going to assign all the resonances here. So let me take this next toxy track. So what does this cross peak tell us? Methyl. So this is valine or leucine. And what did I say about the gamma proton, uh, the beta protons of valine? Methine, typically, it's beta to an electron withdrawing group. So it's typically about two, a little further downfield than two. This is, so this is our leucine. So. This is our phi NH. This is our Lu NH. So I'll just trace that up to here on the diagonal. So there's our Lu NH. So our Lu methyls are hiding right in this cluster here. So that is our Lu deltas. 
and then our Lu betas and gammas are lumped together over here. Where's our valine hiding? Yeah, the one just below it. Look at that. Sneaky devil. <laughs> Sneaky devil. That valine NH is hiding right under the phenyl group, and you wouldn't have known it except that darn phenyl is not part of a spin system with methyl groups. And here we see the cross peak for our valine uh, beta, uh, gamma protons, the methyls. And here's the cross peak for our valine beta proton. And look at that. That valine beta proton has a nice splitting pattern because it's a hydrogen that's split by the methyls and also split by the methine it actually ends up being a doublet of septets, if you want a, want a technical analysis for it. And hiding under here is our alpha proton. Oops, I didn't, I meant to mark. I marked our Lu betas and gammas. I marked our Lu NH. And so if I trace up here, that guy is the Lu alpha. So I'm going to label him because we are going to victoriously assign every resonance here. So, okay, we've got our Lu alpha. Now let's go on and we'll do our valine toxy track. So sneakily hiding under here is our veil NH. Underneath this group here is our veil alpha, right close to the phenyl, phenylalanine alpha. Here's our veil beta. And underneath the methyl cluster, a little bit off on the side if you trace your tracks, is your veil gammas. All right, so we've got our veil, and this is our phenyl. All right, so what do we have left, left to trace out? So we've got, we've got one more. This is the whole NH region here. So we've got one more NH, but something's funny. Something's funny about this. What's left for NH? Ornithine. Proline doesn't have an NH. It's the one amino acid that doesn't have an NH. So this has to be, this has to be ornithine. And yet you look at this guy and you say, wait a second. Okay, so we've got our alpha here. We have, this has to be ornithine. We've got our alpha. That's the alpha over here. We've got a bunch of stuff over here, but remember what I said, the delta of ornithine is like the delta of lysine. It's like the epsilon of lysine, right? It's next to an ammonium group. It should be at about three parts per million. We don't see a track for it. Now we're doing a 78 millisecond spin lock time. And remember I said the longer the spin lock time, the more jumps you can make. But of course, there's the big caveat, if you go too long, you've got relaxation. 
You're also putting a lot of power into the spectrometer for the spin lock mixing, so you can't go too long or you're going to be turning your sample into cooked eggs. You're going to be heating it up with all the radio frequency radiation. So, you have to go six hops to go from the alpha pro from the NH of ornithine to the delta protons of ornithine, and we're not quite going there in 78 milliseconds spin lock mixing time. So normally if you go there, you see the same tracks repeated again and again. So for example, you get a toxy track for the phenylalanine alphas where you can see, see here, you get the, the um, on the phenylalanine, you get the betas and you'll get the um, alpha proton here and then the NH over here. But here we're not getting all of our cross peaks. So we're getting our ornithine, you're getting your ornithine betas and gammas. They're right under here. but not your ornithine epsilon. But look what happens now. If we haven't gone all the way through, I can just pick a different toxy track. So if instead of starting at the ornithine NH, I start at the ornithine alpha proton, now, look, you get one more cross peak. So you still have this cross peak here. But now we get one more, and there's our missing orn, orn delta protons. And so the orn delta, if you trace it up, traces up right underneath over here. So it's right over there. All right, we have only one residue left to assign at this point. All we have left to assign is our proline. This, by the way, is our ammonium, so this is our NH3+. And so all I need to do is pick an unclaimed residue and work my way through. So we haven't claimed this guy yet, right? He kind of stands out. And he's got to be something associated with the proline. He's too far upfield to be a proline alpha proton. So he's our proline <laughs> delta proton, right? Alpha, beta, gamma, delta. So there we'll start with our proline delta proton. And I'll just draw my toxy track. Proline, of course, doesn't have an NH, so we have nothing out in the NH region. And I can just trace all of my cross peaks. So we have our proline delta over here, and then I can trace these guys up here. So here's my proline alpha. It's lumped right under here. Looks like it's a little bit downfield, so it's that guy right at the edge. There's our pro-alpha. There's our pro-delta right over there. I'll just, whoops. And then these guys over here are our proline betas and gammas. So I can just trace them, trace them right up. And it's basically one of them's lumped under our water peak. And then one of them's over here. And then the last one is kind of right over here. And so these guys are our pro, beta, and gamma. And so the point in this is, in very short order, we've gone ahead and been able to get all of our resonance assignments for, I don't even know how many different protons, but a bunch of different protons. And it was a lot less painful and a lot more quick 
than trying to trace our way through a cozy. And in a cozy, in that region with the betas and gammas where things overlapped heavily, we would have been completely stumped. We would have traced our leucine methyls into the beta and gamma region and never been able to trace our way over to the leucine alpha or the leucine NH proton. We would have been lost. So this is a very nice example of how TOXI deals with overlap. All right, the last experiment I wanted to present is ROSI. We've already presented NOSI. NOSI is a 2D NOE experiment. The big problem with NOSI is that you go from having positive NOEs to having negative NOEs as you go from small molecules to very big molecules. In that intermediate range, molecules of, say, molecular weight of, let's say, about 1,000 to 1,500, you often have zero NOEs. And what ROSI is, is NOEs in the rotating frame. It's rotating frame overhauser effect. So it's basically like NOSI, but for intermediate weight. It's actually the same pulse sequence as a toxi. It uses a different level of power in the spin lock mixing. And so it's good when you have molecules that have zero NOEs. So I want to go ahead and show us the, nosy spe the ROSI spectrum for gramocidin S. And ROSI is particularly good for for dealing with stereochemistry and conformational analysis, just as we use NOEs to deal with stereochemistry and conformational analysis and proximity, you can use ROSI for the same thing. So I'll show you an example, and I'll show you one little highlight. So here's our, oh, and I should give you your next handout, and actually I'll give us two handouts so I can finish us up here. So this is the, what I'm handing out right now is the rosy spectrum of gramocidin S, and I just want to show you what it's showing about the conformation of the molecule. And then what I'll do is just give us a little hint on the upcoming homework set where we'll use, use rosy and toxi. If there aren't enough, sweep them, sweep them over. I made, I made enough of these. All right, I've actually, I've actually drawn the molecule. I've drawn gramocidin S in a realistic conformation. It's actually this extended conformation. And what's cool about this extended beta strand conformation is you can basically trace your way from residue to residue. So each of your alpha protons are pointing, basically your side chain is pointing out of the blackboard and back into your blackboard. The hydrogen here is pointing like this. The hydrogen here is pointing like this. The alpha hydrogen here is pointing like this while the valine side chain is pointing out. And so what this ends up doing is it puts the inter-residue distance as very short and actually gives you a much further intra-residue NH alpha distance. So let me show you how this manifests itself in the rosy spectrum of the molecule. So this region here, and of course this region here, is the cross peaks between the NHs and the alphas, right? Because we've got our NHs here in the 8 ppm range and the alphas in the 4 to 5 ppm range. So 
we've just blown this up over here. This is actually from Nakanishi's book. So Nakanishi blew this up. So let's go ahead and look at, say, this cross peak here. This is a cross peak between phenylalanine NH and Lu alpha. And you notice that that cross peak is very, very strong, right? Here's our phi NH, here's our Lu alpha. And then if you look at the other cross peak off of the NH, it's much weaker. This is our, this one here is our Lu, Lu NH, uh, Lu alpha. This is our, uh, I'm sorry, our phi, phi alpha, phi NH to phi alpha. It's much weaker because they're not staring each other in the face. We see that same behavior over here. This one here is our Lu NH to Orn alpha. And again, these guys are staring each other in the face. Here's the Lu NH, here's the Orn alpha. And you'll notice the cross peak with the, of the Lu NH and the Lu alpha is much weaker. Remember, NOE cross peaks vary as distance to the inverse sixth. So if you have two hydrogens that are close to each other, like two and a half angstroms, you get a much stronger NOE than if you have hydrogens a little further apart, like three and a half angstroms. Remember that table I put up of relative intensities, where it was like a tenfold difference in intensity of NOEs. Finally, here you have the Orn NH to Vail alpha. And so that's, that's this one right over here. So you can see this sort of extended beta strand conformation of the molecule. Okay, you're going to use this exact same type of analysis in your homework to assign all the residues in this molecule which forms a hydrogen bonded dimer. And I want to give you a couple of little hints on it. One of the little hints is in assigning your resonances, you'll be able to identify these methylenes, this methyl and methylene. You'll be able to use NOEs to walk your way over. You'll be able to use COSY and TOXY to walk your way through the aromatic ring systems. You'll be able to look for hydrogens that are close to each other across the ring and see evidence of dimerization in your structure. Of course, if you have two hydrogens that are symmetrical, you won't see a cross peak between them because they're, they're one resonance. Anyway, go ahead, have fun with this. <laughs> you will actually be able to apply these same skills to basically work your way through the spin systems, do the toxi to get all of your assignments, and then do the rosy to go ahead and figure out which hydrogens are close to each other. You can't, you can't see a proton with itself because if you have a hydrogen at, at 4 ppm and it's the same hydrogen at 4 ppm, you can't get a cross peak. So those two are symmetrical. All right, so that'll be something you'll be doing, doing I guess, over the, uh, over the weekend.